Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the McKercher LLP lecture series at the College of Law. My name is Brent Cotter. I'm a professor at the college and a member of the Senate of Canada. Today, and on behalf of the Speakers Committee at the University of Saskatchewan, I'd like to welcome you to the third episode of Reenvisioning Policing in Canada. This episode is presented as part of the McKercher LLP lecture series at the college. As we gather virtually today, I acknowledge that I'm on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to our, the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'd like to begin by thanking McKercher LLP for sponsoring our lecture series. They have been supporters of the series for many years now. This year's events will look a little different, virtual, but we promise the topics will not, will not only be informative and educational, but also relevant to what's happening in the world today. Uh, David Stack, QC, a partner in the Saskatoon office and a friend of the College of Law for a long time, will say a few words to welcome you. I'll play that for you now. McKercher LLP has had the privilege of being a proud supporter of this lecture series since its start in 2014. The decision to support the College of Law in these lectures was an easy one for us, as we understand firsthand the great job that the College does in educating and preparing successful lawyers. Education, knowledge and innovation are crucial in securing the future success of our province. Our support for this initiative provides a catalyst for provoking thought, enhancing collaboration and engaging future leaders. With the transition of these lectures to the virtual format, we hope that this will provide an even greater opportunity for the College of Law to enlighten and engage students, lawyers, and our community on these important topics. Stay safe, be well, and enjoy. Today, I'm joined by Senator Gwen Boniface, former commissioner of the Ontario Provincial Police and now a member of the Senate of Canada. A police leader, lawyer, educator, Gwen Boniface is globally recognized for bringing justice and equity to a wide range of issues and having a profound effect on women in policing. She became the first woman appointed as commissioner of the Ontario Provincial Police and is the first female president of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. Senator Boniface has worked tirelessly to repair relationships with First Nations communities, initiating many reforms to promote Aboriginal policing. I was speaking recently with people from Kenora, reflecting on the challenges, here I'm talking about Kenora, Ontario, of the challenges that have been faced by many uh, Northern Ontario communities uh, with significant Indigenous populations, and these Indigenous leaders raved about the work that Gwen had done in their community when she was the Commissioner. As a consultant on policing and justice issues, both internationally and domestically, she provided services to universities, municipalities, government, and nonprofit organizations in the areas of human rights, policing, and justice. She's a longtime member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, where she served as Deputy Executive Director. In addition, she was the founding president of the Canadian Police Chiefs International Service Agency, a nonprofit organization created to address sexual exploitation of children. She was invested with the Order of Canada in 2001 in recognition of her service for the province and for her work with First Nation communities, and she is one of the real leaders in the Senate of Canada. Welcome, Senator Boniface. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, contribute to this discussion. I think it's a very important one for Canada, it's an important one for policing, and it's an important one for communities. Uh, as, uh, as you know, I'm Gwen Boniface. I served in policing for 30 years in Canada, uh, particularly in Ontario and uh, with the Ontario Provincial Police. And I've had this fabulous opportunity to have served overseas. I lived in Ireland for three years, worked with the Irish police on uh, the Garda Síochána on uh, police reform and uh, spent some time uh, with the United Nations in New York, particularly working with uh, conflict, post-conflict countries uh, on rebuilding their security apparatus um, and particularly around issues of 
policing and police community relations. I've been uh, delighted to have, uh, in addition, done work in places like Morocco and Afghanistan. And it's really given me a unique opportunity, first as a Canadian, um, it's a great privilege to be asked to work elsewhere in the world, uh, but also um, as somebody who deeply uh, believes that community relations is an important aspect for a society. I think it uh, opened those opportunities for me to learn about um, initiatives uh, in various countries around the world and uh, work with people from all over the world, particularly at the UN with police officers from all over the world. So I've been quite privileged and I hope I can add something to this discussion uh, that is uh, helpful and meaningful. Uh, I'm honored to be included with uh, two esteemed colleagues in this lecture series and I I hope that we'll learn and perhaps we'll initiate some dialogue uh, amongst all, all of you uh, to talk about what we want going forward and what Canada needs going forward from a police and uh, community perspective. And I think it more importantly, uh, how we create an environment in Canada where we're able to address some of the uh, significant issues that have been raised on uh, the role of police how they, they interact with community and how best we engage to uh, create safe, uh, safety and security for communities. So I'm really uh, deeply honored and deeply honored as a senator to be asked to include uh, in, in this discussion. So let's, uh, let's start the discussion and let's talk a little bit about what are the issues and the challenges faced by police and, and really faced by community members today. I think uh, some of the challenges faced by police are uh, responding to calls where they don't have the solution. It's interesting how we train police, which is a whole other issue, um, but that they are to be solution oriented. And as you all know, with the aspects of uh, mental health calls particularly, the police are not the solution to the problem and the issues that are faced by um, community members that it is a public health issue, it's not a policing issue. And many people have said this is one of the key issues that we need to address, that we need to start to think about other ways of responding and not leaving it to the police to do. I think realistically, the answer to that is uh, partially correct. I think the reality is, is that in many cases when the police get called to mental health calls, it's already, uh, attempts have already been made by family and others, by medical institutions um, to try to address the issue and um, it is complicated by perhaps some threats against individuals or against themselves in which uh, it automatically defaults to the police to deal with. I think from the police perspective, and I, I don't want to speak for police because I'm out of the institution now for some time, but I, I really want to talk about how we as a society want best to see those calls uh, addressed. Many people have suggested social workers and police together. I think that's really uh, ideal and has been done in a number of areas, and I would be really interested in seeing the research um, and a study of outcomes that, that made that uh, approach better uh, so that we can see what works, what doesn't, how best, how best to move it forward. The second thing I think that is uh, really uh, important is the training for officers on issues of understanding um, the type of resentment they face or the type of questioning they face in, a, in an environment where they're quite accustomed to being able to take control. So when I think about the historical and colonial cloak that uh, impacts the indigenous community, having that information as officers is a really important piece in how they make decisions as they go forward. And if we don't give them that information, if we don't ensure they have that information, I think we make an error in giving them all the tools in the toolbox to be able to deliver the service. We are often hear that these are issues of racism, absolutely. There are issues of racism, no doubt about it. They're right across our society, they're in every institution we see them in the education system, in the public health system, you only have to have been reading the papers the last few months. 
So the real question, I think, is how do you inform and educate the deliverers of the service to ensure that they understand the context in which they are delivering that service? If this was um, an operational need, deal dealt with as an operational need, that officers need this as part of their skill base, we would see it very differently, just like they have to make sure they do firearms training, just like they have to make sure they do some of their physical training. This is a really important piece. I think the other piece we have to uh, really think about is how do we do the proactive work and how do we value the proactive work that many um, communities and police are engaged. I look at the work on community mobilization across the country, and I must say it's impressive in terms of how they try to address the issues in a proactive way. This is absolutely crucial. We often think of these issues in the context of an urban center. So I want you to think harder outside of the urban center and think about the rural and smaller communities that don't have all the resources that urban centers have. Because that changes what your expectations are of the role of police in the community. I can't take somebody to a, a, in a mental health crisis to an emergency um, a department if it's 45 minutes away, it's a, it, it means I engage much longer as a police officer than if that um, individual is, is in an urban center where you're five minutes to the emergency department. And I would bet that the resources available in that urban center are far greater than are available in a small community. I just want to give you an example, and I hope I've captured this information accurately. In my community of 30,000 in Ontario, our detachment commander here announced um, at one of the meetings, uh, police board meetings, that they had had in one week 31 calls for attempt suicide or threatening suicide in one week. In one week, 31 calls. For me, that says more about our community than it does about the police. It tells me that within our resources, within the community, we don't have the capacity to deal with the issues in a proactive manner that should make those calls far less than they are. And that's the issues that the community and community members and family members are facing on these types of issues. They don't have another resource. Their resources are far, far away. I have a friend who's told me that in dealing with a member of her family with mental health issues, she often reaches out to the police officer because she can never get the type of service, immediate service from the social services because they are so overworked. I think this is a crucial issue to deal with because what we are doing is making it a last resort instead of a first resort response. And that is sending the wrong people at the wrong time to the wrong place. That would be my first issue on the challenges faced by police and families. We forget in this context that when police respond, often at the request of the family, the family has done so much trying to assist but can't get the assistance you require. You only need to read anything in the last three months on the opioid crisis, and you will hear mothers crying for help to assist their child who has attempted or committed suicide as a result of the opioids overdose. This is so important. We need to think hard about the types of challenges that we are asking society to deal with and then we need to talk about what we do about it. So let's identify the issue and those challenges. I want you to think about what are those challenges and those issues, and then make sure that we're able to deal with that in a more comprehensive uh, way, and where perhaps our investment needs to take place in a different way. It could or could not be that we are invested on the wrong end of the spectrum, we could also, I suspect, find out that we have uh, multiple resources 
not necessarily working in an integrated, integrated fashion by either, uh, you know, holding on to what you see as your mandate, uh, geography. I mean, does it make sense if you can't get service in one area that you can't get that, that you can't be moved to get trans assistance in another area? These are all key issues. So I think the challenges for police is they're doing job on those types of issues that they have always done, but not in the same way because they don't have the resources to, uh, to refer uh, people to. And for citizens, in particular for families, and I feel deeply for families that have to deal with, uh, you know, the care and the concern for their family member who is unable to do that for themselves, this uh, engagement um, into the system is a very difficult process, very difficult and very, very trying. So I think in many ways the analysis has to be across the spectrum. I think these are the most significant issues, and I'm hoping in many ways that the, the look at how the police respond to these issues or how the police engage with members of the public will help us ask ourselves the question, how do we move towards this in a way that makes sure that we reduce the need for the engagement and we start to think about police in a different way, and that is a part of the front-end solution, not just the, fi the, the, the final uh, step in the process. I was really quite intrigued by a former colleague of mine who's still in the, uh, working in the OPP, and he said with all the issues they have in their community of homelessness, of drug addiction, of alcoholism, he said his approach is arrest at the last resort as the only thing left that we can do. And so when I heard off an officer at a very senior level talk about all the other steps in the community they could take, I heard a different approach. And I'm wondering whether we have many of these approaches, I'm absolutely certain of it, across the country and how we make sure that information is available so we can look at whether or not this is a best practice. Is it making a difference? What are the similarities between this community and that community that could be adapted? And how would we look at that going forward in a way that says exactly like he did, how do we get to a point where having to deal with it by the police through an arrest is the only step left in the process? So I'd like us to think a little bit about that for now. One of the most uh, significant things I think that as we move forward, particularly with respect to our uh, communities uh, uh, that feel uh, disconnected from the police and indeed um, in some ways under threat by the police, I think the important thing we have to talk about is how do you build uh, and sustain trust? There is uh, a fundamental inability to police if you can't uh, gain the trust of the community. And in some areas uh, in the country, we find ourselves as exactly that. It's hard to acknowledge that as someone who put in 30 years of policing. But I also have to be a realist in terms of my own commitment to the community and how we may um, help create the path that takes us forward. We experienced this, uh, quite frankly, within the OPP after the shooting at Ipperwash. And uh, for any of my colleagues who um, and students, uh, members of the public are listening, if you have an opportunity to read that report, it's a very important one in how it talks about building respectful relationships uh, with uh, the Indigenous community. And what we learned in that process, particularly, was the real importance of understanding the issues from somebody else's perspective and really understanding that there's always um, a variety of perspectives, none that are more legitimate than the others. Um, but as a deliverer of service, what you need to ab absolutely appreciate is that you, your lens is different than the lens uh, of others who are receiving your service. So I think that it's very clear. I don't think there's a police uh, leader anywhere in the country who, who wouldn't say trust is uh, the number one issue. And building that trust takes a great path. 
and a difficult path. I, I have said often that it's uh, uh, in rebuilding the trust, uh, it's one step forward and two steps backwards because although everyone may come to the table with good intentions, um, it's not always easy to um, build a trust so that as people make missteps, which is human error, um, then uh, that you also have enough trust built that people know that your intentions may um, have been different, uh, may have been better. So I think in many ways, one of the great challenges for police will be building it forward, uh, that building that path going forward and figuring out how you uh, build trust in a way that uh, helps you um, deliver the type of service you want to deliver. And I have no doubt that people want to deliver a good service. I think that's fundamental to why people join policing. I think the second thing that we have to really think hard about is um, what the expectations are um, and for the presence in the community and what that presence means to various people. So there's different ways, I think, that you can deliver a service. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more proactive work than it's done. It's not the way we fund. It's not the way we are viewed through the media. Um, we're often viewed through our reaction, our reactive reaction to calls, our ability to investigate, our ability to deliver charges in certain circumstances. That's how we're viewed. The work that's done proactively and by often a select a select group of officers that we don't hear much about is often the work that is probably most crucial uh, in terms of building that trust. And I think in many ways, one of the challenges that police are going to have to face is how do you measure success? Do you measure success in your reactive work? Do you measure it in your proactive work? And how do you make sure that officers who are doing the proactive work are, are rewarded equally as those who are doing the reactive work. You know, this goes back to the heart and the culture of policing in terms of the issues of um, soft policing versus hard policing. Uh, I think uh, one of the things we really need to think about, and I've talked to a lot of officers recently about this, is what about the people who are doing the really important work for on you know, mental health, on community mobilization, who are working with the homeless, what type of acknowledgement are they getting within their organization? Because I've always been a firm believer in that what gets measured gets done. And if we're measuring by old statistical methods, like how many charges you laid, how many warnings you gave, how do we actually measure the work that may actually be true prevention and, and taking those reactive occurrences out of the way. I think that's a really important piece. The second piece that is talked about often was body-worn cameras, and I was struck by one of the police chiefs who said, quite frankly, you need to work on the person behind the camera, not creating the camera. Uh, and I think that that's a really good point. Many people caution us on the issue of uh, body-worn cameras, I think it's such an important issue, is that it's not the be-all and end-all. I know a number of jurisdictions in Canada have looked at this issue and thought about um, it as an implementation tool in terms of accountability. So the early answer, of course, is yes, it can be helpful, I think, uh, but also it, it is a, a particularly um, logistical issue uh, in terms of storage of data, such like. But it's also, I think, uh, um, has its limitations. And um, I think in many ways, um, in my own preference, from, from my own experience, I would say actually in-car cameras were probably our more uh, an al alternative tool, maybe more effective. Um, I think the, the research would say mixed on both from the perspective of what you want to accomplish. So a body-worn camera will only give you the perspective of the view of, from uh, how the camera sits. And as you know, in, in incidents, and we see this with cell phones all the time, um, there is, it'll, it'll give you one perspective, but not necessarily the entire um, incident as um, it takes place. I think 
there's an assumption by some community members that officers will be resistant to body-worn cameras, um, perhaps in some places. My experience with um, officers really is that they are so accustomed, the young officers today, so accustomed to cell phones being present at every call they're at, to being videoed at every call they're at, that it is, um, it doesn't cause them great concern at all. Um, and may, maybe in some ways, officers have a preference to have a what you would look at as a sort of an official view from from their perspective or the organization's perspective. But I think the really important piece and the point that the chief was making, which we shouldn't lose sight of, is that it's really about investing in the right place. And the question for municipal councils, for provinces, for the federal government um, will be, is this the best investment at the best point in time? And does it fit with the other tools and the other methods of accountability? What I would not want uh, body-worn cameras to be viewed as a sole solution to the challenges going forward or to the issues that have been raised or the um, very important um, methods available to bridge relationships with the community. So while I think technology is one part of it, or could be part of it, it is not the full solution to what actually is a human service. And the important part, as the chief said, is making sure that the person behind the camera has the skills, abilities, the tools in their toolbox to be able to the, do the work that we expect them to do. And I think uh, for many communities, um, they'll want to see a combination of, of uh, solutions that ultimately lead to what I think all people want, whether it's community whether, or the police, and that is a sense of security and safety for the people that you serve and the people in your community, particularly the people who are most vulnerable. So that to me is... Um, really an important issue that we can't see this as the the panacea um, because it to, it allows us to step outside what our understanding should be and that is that this is a human service and a human service requires to invest in good human skills so let me talk then um, about other factors we hear often around questions of training um, I've heard, I uh, did an interview not that long ago where the individual said, um, the interviewer said, you know, I don't think we can keep talking about training because we've been talking about training for a long time and it doesn't seem to be changing things. Um, I would push back on that. I would say that training um, actually is extremely helpful. Um, as society has evolved, as we have looked at a number of issues in our society, uh, uh, the impact of colonialism as an example, and had a different level of awareness on what that actually meant for us as a society, us as uh, Canadians, I think, has changed the way people think. And what is that really about? Well, that's informing people, giving them a different perspective, giving them uh, a, a different balanced history lesson. And I think it is really important that that be part of it. So whether you call it awareness raising, whether you call it training, um, whatever format you give it um, on issues of, of uh, Indigenous rights, on issues of uh, systemic racism, this is crucial information to for officers to understand. And if it fits within the bailiwick of, of training within their definition, so be it. I think that is an important piece. We can never stop educating people. Never stop or your organization will grind to a halt. This is absolutely crucial when you deliver a human service. And so for me, it's really about continuing to invest in training, thinking hard about what your policies say, what they infer, how they're interpreted, how they're implemented, and doing an ongoing analysis of how that training, those policies, the actions of your officers fit together um, to create what your overall service uh, delivers and what your overall service stands for. 
So I would say for organizations um, facing the future that they do, working with their community, they need to think hard about what that training entails. And I would suggest, as I've seen in other jurisdictions, particularly in the U.S., that some of that training take place with community leaders. Uh, really important to be able to hear the views across the table around raising um, issues of awareness and making sure that we have the opportunity to capture on how aspects you learn in training apply directly to your community uh, that you serve. The important aspects we should speak about is um, all of the work that's been done uh, throughout uh, the, the country around issues of uh, police and community relations, uh, whether they're in specific incidents uh, and um, or in reference to particular investigations like the Campbell Inquiry in Ontario, or whether it has to do with police community relations, which would go back in, with reports into the 70s and 80s. And I think one of the things that we have... Um, been unsuccessful in Canada doing, as many countries experience the same thing, is much of this incredible work um, that's produced gets lost on the shelves um, over time and uh, are, it's often forgotten uh, that that work takes place. So I think there's an opportunity now as we face um, a crossroads, really, in the police community relations in some corners of the country. Um, to think about uh, about those reports and what they entailed and make a decision around their relevance for today and whether or not there are things to be learned um, from those reports and actually uh, look at the recommendations in a way that makes such a big difference um, in some jurisdictions going forward. I would specifically look at uh, issues of police oversight how has or oversight evolved over uh, the last number of decades? Um, has it reached a point uh, where people see it as uh, creating greater openness and transparency? I think there would be mixed views on that. And uh, I think uh, because the differences exist province to province, uh, given the jurisdiction which policing falls in, I think it would be a really good opportunity to look at what sort of standard we would like in place in Canada in order to have complaints dealt with, whether those complaints are against individual officers, against the organizations, and how that may help us learn from the mistakes of the past. I think this will be a very crucial thing. Uh, I was really struck in a conversation some time ago, a few weeks back, uh, with someone who said, they're always perplexed at the concept of ethical policing when in fact, if it's not ethical, it's not policing. And I think that was a brilliant uh, observation and also probably a very good starting point for where we start to set a standards for the country that really speaks to um, the importance of how police deliver a service within communities. And I believe, and I've said this, uh, I think earlier in this lecture that it's not just about how individual officers' conduct is. Yes, indeed, that's a really important aspect. An important aspect on what is the decision-making process for an officer in a particular set of circumstances. But the really, um, really important way to influence officer behavior is how you, within the organization, um, send the message on what you feel is appropriate uh, action on their behalf, uh, what type of training you provide, what type of awareness raising you provide, what kind of education you've provided, what policies you put in, frame, in the framework for them. And that to me is probably some of the most crucial work that has been done. I think it's fair to say in Canada in the last few decades there's been um, lots of inquiries um, that could well inform us and which for reasons that are really subject to election cycles and other aspects get lost in levels of importance with competing priorities uh, that really need, uh, as I said, to be looked at again. 
But I also think that there's an opportunity here to look at um, creating good research uh, methods, taking a look at what Statistics Canada actually um, captures from policing, and asking ourselves whether or not there is a much more fulsome approach that could be taken so that we get a better snapshot from coast to coast to coast on the type of issues that police are dealing with and capture it in a way that's far more meaningful for the work that we do. And as I said before, police don't operate in isolation. Um, in many ways, what we should look at if we want to be very effective as a country and how we deal with our most vulnerable populations, our minority populations, and uh, the community in general is really look at how we provide the service from start to finish. Uh, not just the policing service. I mean from the initial call on what agencies should be engaged or have been engaged in that process right to the very end and a more integrated, holistic approach. Uh, many um, commentators have spoken about this, particularly police leaders, about the need for a more integrated approach. I think the other piece that becomes very important for us as we think forward is we need to start to shape what our future could look like in the community relationship issue. Um, with all public uh, institutions. The police are part of a bigger justice system. Sometimes our courts don't respond the way that we think are in the best interest of, of um, an accused. We think victims don't get well served. Uh, there are so many uh, machinations uh, that come out of a system that has such a series of steps in the process from first interaction to the final stage. And those really, uh, cannot be done in isolation of the other without having some impact. Similarly, as some police chiefs have also argued, which I think is a good point, is that we need to identify the, the nature of, of the uh, issue, particularly around issues of mental health. We need to venture what are the nature of the needs of the individual and then step forward from there in the range of issues the range of uh, aspects uh, of their needs uh, can be uh, dealt with. Let me be more clear. Identifying what the, what the issues are in the broadest sense and then looking at whether it's treatment, whether it's public health, whether it's family support, whatever those steps need to be taken, you look at it in a more holistic matter, not just as a criminal law matter. And I think in many ad hoc ways um, that's being done, but I think it's really crucial for us to talk about it in a much more connected way. Also, I think as we sit down, we sit down at the community level, I use again my community as an example of 30,000, it's really a discussion between community uh, leaders and community members and the police. And it's important that the community have a feel and a say in, in what it gets done and how that delivery of service needs to take place on all fronts, on all sort of public uh, delivery agencies. This is a, would be a bit unusual, but I think it's so important in terms of making sure that the community understands the resources available, how those use, resources are used, and then ways in which they think it may change. And the biggest voice at the table, uh, I think, needs to be the community. Um, and it's an important voice to be heard. I think that would help us think hard about how we want the funding of policing to be done, funding of public health agencies to be done, social service agencies, all of the people who are working within the system and perhaps in many ways, it's a systematic approach that needs to take place. Let me um, bring some of my final comments um, forward at this point um, and grateful for that you've uh, listened this long and um, I hope that some of the 
issues that I've raised so would be helpful in, in thinking forward uh, on uh, the police community relations. I think it's really important, uh, as I've indicated, that we look at a number of aspects of um, policing and particularly what the job is, uh, what it should be, what it could be, and how its interaction uh, is with other agencies that may be uh, better equipped to deal with aspects of um, police interactions uh, at an earlier point in time. Uh, that for me is a really important issue. Uh, we are faced now at this point in our country with a pandemic, but we are actually losing more people uh, over the time of the pandemic to opioid uh, overdoses. And I think this is a matter that has should bring to the forefront for us the really urgent need for a different approach in public health and uh, also a different approach in the interaction between police and uh, community members on this issue. On the second issue of uh, systemic racism, as I've acknowledged in the early part of this discussion, this is a really crucial issue that we need to confront uh, as, uh, as a society in Canada and look to ways in which all institutions, including policing, can change. There are, as I indicated, a number of th reports that would be helpful in this process. What we really need is uh, a sense of action on behalf of all levels of government to make a commitment on this um, issue going forward. And there, the work is there, the work has been done. There's probably some more work to do, but we would be um, well positioned to start with uh, the efforts that have already been made in a number of inquiries and reports. And I think you have expressed a willingness on behalf of police leadership to be part of this process. Well, it's been a very interesting discussion. Let me just close by saying uh, I think it will be really important for us to put a lot of thought to how we move forward as a country in the future with respect to community safety and community security and community well-being. I think those three issues are absolutely crucial in consideration and underlying all uh, aspects uh, that we may think about going into the future. It is definitely time, a good time, to rethink how we deliver service in communities, um, no matter what perspective you're delivering from. And perhaps a really important time for the community to have uh, a strong voice at the table to talk about the uh, manner in which delivery is uh, done and how it could change for the future. We have lived through a pandemic, continue to do so, as Canadians, and we've pulled together very well. And I'm hopeful that on issues of community safety, policing, mental health, systemic racism, we will also have the will and the skill to be able to pull this discussion together and come out with uh, an implementation plan that will make a difference for the next generation. That is what should matter for Canadians. It should matter for everybody involved in delivery of service and all those receiving that service. So I'm grateful to have been able to be part of this discussion and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, that was terrific. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined us online. We hope that you can join us again next Monday, October 26th, for the fourth and final episode of Re-Envisioning Policing in Canada with the University of Toronto law professor Kent Roach. Thanks for being with us.